Good afternoon. I don't know why I always say good evening, good afternoon, because people watch this all different times of the day. <laughs> so excuse me for that, but welcome. That's what I should say. Welcome to our uh, midweek Bible study podcast. I'm so glad to have you join us uh, at this moment. Uh, as many of you know, I am supplementing uh, this month uh my sermon series uh, from Sunday uh, with the Bible studies midweek. Uh, so in other words, we're going to expound a little bit on a, a portion or one part of what I talked about on Sunday. And last Sunday I spoke on uh, a white Christmas as we're going through the colors of Christmas. And uh, I, I spoke on that a little bit. Uh, one of the points I spoke about when talking about the color white and how it has to do with the Bible and with Christmas, is that the color white speaks of the wisdom of God. He's described as having white hair and wearing a white robe. Um, there's other things, of, other places in, that describe him as having various things of white as well. Um, and, you know, it's uh, Daniel and John, as well as some other uh, literature, ancient Jewish literature, like the Book of Enoch, that also described the same thing. Um, some people say, well, is that the Father, or is that Jesus that, that Daniel's having this vision of? Uh, well, uh, let's just say it's God and leave it there. Um, Daniel does call him the Ancient of Days. Uh, in any case, the pure white hair and the robes speak of purity, they speak of holiness, they speak of righteousness, they speak of justice, and yes, it speaks of the wisdom of God as well. So as we think of the dreams of a white Christmas, I hope to remind us all of the wisdom of God and let that white uh, dream, the dream of that white snow or the white lights often that you see at Christmas, sometimes even you know fake snow, um, white ornaments, whatever, um, that that can remind us of the wisdom of God. Uh, and that is um, displayed uh, in the uh, coming uh, of Jesus, the Messiah. And it's also displayed uh, in uh, how uh, he takes care of Satan and those who serve him as well. Uh, it's reminded, reminded of those things. The problem with the wisdom of God is that we sometimes say we trust it, but then we're not so sure. We see things around us, and sometimes, if we kind of, where the rubber meets the road, we cut it down to the chase, why people don't trust God, even though they're Christians, and even though they, uh, you know, might go to church and say that they believe in Him, and they, but they have a hard time trusting Him. It's because often uh, there's a couple things that could be happening, happening and maybe not the only reasons why people don't trust him, but one of the reasons is people think they know better. Okay, and one of the other reasons is I think sometimes people look around and they think, wow, evil's winning. Satan is has the upper hand. He's got God on the ropes. I don't know. Uh, it's hard to believe that a Christian would think that maybe, you know, is God going to be victorious or not? But it's true. Uh, but in the end, it's true that people think that, but in the end, neither of those things are true. We don't know better. Our plans aren't better than God's. And if he has a different plan than us, his plan is better. And that Satan is not winning. He does not have uh, God backed into a corner. Uh, God knows exactly what he's doing. And uh, we're going to go to the book of Psalm. Uh, we're going to look at the 37th Psalm, starting in verse 12. And I'm just going to read this to you. Uh, this is David, okay? The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and bent their bow to cast down the afflicted and the needy, to slay those who are upright in conduct. Their sword will enter their own heart, and their bows will be broken. Better is the little of the righteous than the abundance of many wicked. Wow, that has 
some powerful truth. Yeah, I'm going to read that verse again, verse 16. Better is the little of the righteous than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord sustains the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless, and their inheritance will be forever. They will not be ashamed in the time of evil, and in the days of famine they will have abundance. But the wicked will perish, and the enemies of the Lord will be like the glory of the pastures. They vanish like smoke, they vanish away. The wicked borrows and does not pay back, but the righteous is gracious and gives. For those blessed by him will inherit the land, but those cursed by him will be cut off. The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. When he falls, he will not be hurled headlong, because the Lord is the one who holds his hand. I have been young, and now I am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his descendants begging bread. All day long he is gracious and lends, and his descendants are a blessing. Depart from evil and do good, so you will abide forever. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever. But the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. So I think trusting in the wisdom of God and here, this is ultimately what the psalmist is saying, trust in God's wisdom. You may think, oh, it doesn't pay to do what God asks you to do. It doesn't benefit me at all to listen to him or to follow his word or to trust in him. Uh, but that's what ultimately what trusting in the wisdom of God is. It's submitting to his plan. And both of those, trusting in his wisdom and then submitting to his plan, it's kind of the key, one of the big keys to peace and contentment in life. Um, you know, when we are always, and worry is one of these things that shows you you don't trust God. Because you're worried because things aren't going to work out the way you think they should. Instead of trusting that God's wisdom, he knows what he's going to be doing. And also disobedience is a sign of not trusting in God's wisdom. When you know you maybe should do this whatever it is, whether it's in God's word or you've just been praying about a situation and you feel God leading you to do something and you don't do it, it's because you don't trust in his wisdom. I think about when, I, when we see things going crazy, whether it be in the world or in our community, in our family, uh, when it seems that evil people are getting away with things, they're pressing others, as the psalmist writes here, when we see people lie and deceive, when we see people cheat and they seem to win, you know, does that ever bother you when you watch professional sports and you see a team that cheats and wins, you know? Um, and it seems like if there's a certain team that's playing against your team, you feel like they're cheating. You don't see if maybe your team is doing it. But that said, it bothers you. And we, we can tend to think... Um, I'm not sure how God is letting this happen. Why are these people getting away with this stuff? It just makes them angry, you know. And and then you can think, I'm not sure I can trust him because all these people are getting away with stuff. But as we follow God and we begin to see more and more, he truly does work things out. Uh, sometimes we've got to be reminded of that. We remind ourselves of times when that's happened. Um... The thing of it is, is that he's often working at things differently than we would. But that doesn't mean it's wrong. In fact, it means our way is probably not the right way. Right? His wisdom in working a situation out is better than our wisdom. I'm going to kind of make this practical. I'm going to talk to you about a podcaster I heard once talk about how he had worked at a place where the business owner was cruel and vengeful and a petty person, he would um, he was always lying, making promises he didn't keep, trying to turn he would try to turn employees against one another. He would you know pit people against each other, lie about. He would tell one employee that this person did this or said this when they didn't, just to get him to be angry. 
at that person. He would promise bonuses and then not give them. Uh, so this man was working for him, and he said he would pray to God, how can you let this man continue to harass us? And then he still prospers in his business. How can you let him get away with this? Well, after a while, sure enough, this owner got investigated for shady business dealings, and he lost the business. The business ended up closing. But guess what? Then this Christian man lost his job. And he realized part of the reason God wasn't judging this unscrupulous businessman because, because God was using him as an instrument of provision for his follower, for him. He was using, even though this guy was difficult to work for and harassing him and, you know, um, just kind of an evil person, uh, that God was still using him as an instrument of provision in his life. And then when he did bring this justice that he'd been praying for, well, it required the Christian man to trust God again for another job, which did come eventually, but it was a little bit of a trial, a little bit of a difficult time. So uh, he learned a lesson on trusting God's wisdom on both ends of the deal through the difficult um, employer and through the loss of the job. It reminds me a little bit of Habakkuk. In fact, that was this podcaster's, um, what he was relating was the, was the story of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a prophet who cried out to God, and he was upset what he saw in his nation of Israel. And he said to God, how can you let this evil continue? There's idolatry, there's child sacrifice, the temple prostitutes, the oppression, the cruelty, Often they would force young girls to go, and young boys sometimes too, to go to work in the temple as sex prostitutes. This is in supposedly God's chosen land, right? The chosen people. And, uh, you know, all these other things, the child sacrifice and all these things. Not to mention um, just oppression of the common people and uh, just an abandonment of everything that God had called them to do. But then God tells Habakkuk, he says, don't worry, I'm going to send Babylon to destroy Israel. Habakkuk says, wait a minute, I don't know if I like that, I live in Israel. Uh, and he, so he had to trust God's wisdom in both ends. When he saw the things going on, part of the reason why God wasn't you know, sending the judgment on Israel is because there were still good people in Israel who would be affected by that judgment. But then when he did send it, they also had to trust him that God was going to take care of people like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, all people affected by Babylon in the siege and then eventual takeover of the nation. So part of the reason we see evil people seeming to prosper is because if God were to judge evil people in the way we think he should, then innocent people often pay a price as well. For example, COVID-19, it was a remedial judgment on the earth and especially in our nation for the violence, the innocent blood, and the corruption. You think of, of America. America is the most affluent nation in the world, one of the most advanced nations in technology and in medicine. Yet we were, at least according to the statistics, the hardest hit nation. Well, why is that? Well, there could be a number of reasons, but ultimately, spiritually speaking, we were the ones that God was trying to shake the most. But you know what? We all had to go through it, didn't we? We all had hardships because of it. Yet God was with us through every moment. Even in those we lost. Many of us have family and friends that didn't make it through COVID that time. And so uh, we still know and trust, see that God's hand was still with them and took, if they were believers, it took them home. Um, we don't understand it all, even to this day. We don't understand all his purposes in it. But if we take time to submit our hearts and then rest in his wisdom, we'll have peace and strength, the things we don't comprehend. I think that's ultimately the gift, the benefit of 
realizing that God is wise and he has a, a plan, is that he, that's where the peace and strength comes from when you go through things. You just, in the end, trust God. And if he asks you to do something in the midst of whatever you're going through, then you do that. If he asks you to say something, to stand up, then you do that. If he asks you to be quiet and not say anything, you do that. But in the end, it just comes back to trust. Okay, God, you have this. You have a plan through this. I think, you know, we're talking about Christmas here, and I think of Mary and Joseph. And here they were living under not only the Roman rule, but also this um, vassal king, King Herod, who wanted to kill young Jesus. He's, here he is, sitting in his palatial throne, pampered, uh, has all the luxury that could be imagined for that time in history. Uh, he's known in history, Herod the Great is, as a power-hungry, paranoid, violent man. He had members of his own family killed. So it was probably disconcerting for Joseph and Mary to hear that he wanted to kill little Jesus and that they were going to have to flee their nation, their country, and go to another nation that spoke another language and had different customs where they would be strangers, they'd be aliens, and go to Egypt. They might have thought, God, why is Herod trying to kill your son? God, why are you letting this evil man sit on the seat of power, living in luxury, tended to by servants, while your son has to sneak out of the nation in the middle of the night? But God had a plan. We know some of that today. His son came to serve and not be served. He told us that himself. He came to a common family because he came to minister to the common people. Yet still, kings and emperors would bow to worship him through the ages. In fact, even at his birth, rich, powerful, and wise magi came to worship him. So now as we look back, we can see God's hand. We see his protection for not only Jesus... But he was there for Joseph and Mary as well. And we can see the end for Herod as well. Uh, He has been, in his end, is the same for every despot, every tyrant, every murderer that rejects the Messiah. From, you know, Hitler, Pol Pot, Mao Zedong, Joseph Stalin, you name it through history. It's the same end. It's what the psalmist was talking about. And another psalmist says, God looks at them and scoffs and laughs that they think that they are going to rule the universe or whatever. But you contrast that with the eternal reward for Joseph and Mary. And also contrast it with them that they, in the middle of what they were going through, as they submitted and trusted God's wisdom, that they found strength and they found peace in the submission, in the trust. And ultimately, their ultimate reward um, is probably, you know, we know that we know that, you know, part of that reward is obviously eternal life with the Father forever. Um, There are other rewards, I'm sure, that they received as well for their faithfulness to Him. So I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, kind of my closing scripture uh, today. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those who of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, 
Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Is there really truly any foolishness in God or weakness in God? No. But anything we perceive as foolishness or weakness in God, well, it's still better and stronger than anything that you or I could come up with. And that not, is not just for salvation. That is not just the plan of eternity. But that's in my everyday life as well. Submitting to God in my everyday life is better than me coming up with my own plan. Um, and if the enemy comes against me, God knows that. He knows it ahead of time. If people despise me, God knows that too, ahead of time. If I stumble and fall, he's there to pick me back up in his wisdom. As long as I'm willing to submit to it again and say, God, I'm, I need to get back on track. I've gotten off. Please help me. So uh, I I think that as we think of it with this Christmas season, I think it's important to stop and reflect on God's great wisdom and how his understanding is greater than ours and that we need to trust that. There's not things, there's things that we are not going to always understand, things that we're not always going to grasp, but we just have to believe that he does and that he has a plan. Let me pray for you. Lord, I thank you for your great wisdom. I thank you for your great understanding. I thank you that you have something for each and every one of us if we will submit to that plan. Lord, and that, yes, includes salvation. It includes heaven. It includes eternity. But it also includes a plan while we're here on this earth that we need to submit to. So, Lord Jesus, we just once again come to you, acknowledge your great wisdom, repent for um, not trusting in it and going our own way. And we ask you to bring us back, Lord Jesus, into uh, following you and submitting to you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. God bless. Have a blessed Christmas.